All right, thanks so much, Solomon, for your time. So let's talk a bit about the role of multilateral development finance institutions as we continue to move more and more into this African Common Free Trade Agreement. Yeah. And obviously, those are some of the themes we discussed during the panel conversation. First of all, you, your, your thoughts on the role of TFIs as, as we evolve more and more into this more integrated Africa in terms of trade. I mean, so, so Wale, the African continental free trade area is a potential game changer. Uh, first of all, it's a potential game changer for private sector. Uh, the ability to work across borders already increases scale for African companies. And it's not only the African industrialists who tend to be in more markets, but it's also the SMEs who have, you know, who make up really, uh, you know, 90% of the creators of jobs, you know, 80% of our economy. And, and also tend to be the ones who would underpin, uh, you know, the African continental free trade area. Whether they are part of, you know, value chains of the African industrialists or whether they are actually producing and trading across borders. So for us DFIs, you know, we have to make this happen. Uh, there's the political side uh, where countries have to ratify the CFTA, they have to, you know, negotiate tariffs, etc. But also on the private sector side, we have to do a number of key things. We, ha we have to build the infrastructure, especially the regional infrastructure, that will reduce the logistic costs and also reduce the energy costs, make them more you know, reliable and affordable so that what we produce you know, a lot, you know, with value addition is competitive with imports because we cannot you know, use non-tariff barriers to frustrate imports. We have to be competitive. And so regional infrastructure, infrastructure, making sure it's climate resilient so that this will be you know, long, long standing is critical. The other area is really financing the SMEs directly. But it's not only about financing. It's also about providing them the capacity building, providing them the marketplaces where they can connect. So, so providing the SMEs you know, the necessary you know, financing they need uh, is critical. And as you heard really today, uh, you know, from Tades, you know, at Masu, it's not only about liquidity, because in some cases, you know, you know, the, the financial institutions have the liquidity, but they are not comfortable with the risk. So this is where development finance institutions can come in and say, we would risk share with you. You know, as you actually go, you know, more into the SME financing area, we would take 50% of the risk, for example. But in addition, we're going to help the banks build their capacity to understand the risk issues in relation to financing SMEs. So we are very serious about this. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, it's a potential game changer and we have to make it work. All right, so of course we are again here at the second edition of the Intra-Africa Trade Fair. Um, can you just speak to the significance of this event and what do you think it can catalyze? You know, this is a great opportunity for small and medium enterprises to showcase their businesses. Uh, so it's good to see the exhibition part uh, of the IATF. Uh, it's also a good, you know, forum to bring us together, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, you know multilateral finance institutions, whether it's private sectors, you know, I mean, private sector in the same industries, etc. It's a great opportunity to bring us, you know, together. And, and, and we actually, you know, are very supportive of the AFRIEXIM led effort. Uh, we are also very excited that, you know, the chair of the advisory committee is His Excellency, the president, the former president of Nigeria, President Obasanjo. And, and this, is, this is really, I mean, I, I've just flown all the way through Doha to get here. Uh, it's that important, uh, you know, of, of an event. So it, it, it gives us, you know, the chance to have dialogue. Uh, government also is present uh, because without government, we're not going to get the political side of the CFTA Im implemented. And when it comes to the economic and the infrastructure end, uh, this gives us a forum to all come together uh, to make sure that two plus two is equal to five. Absolutely. So let's come back to some of the themes that we discussed during the panel. And I remember we were chatting about capital and what that looks like in terms of trying to raise it as a DFI currently. Um, obviously, the last 18 months have been so challenging for not just businesses, but I will say even financial institutions. So what has been your experience in terms of capital raising? How do you think the environment has been redefined by the pandemic? 
I mean, so for the African Development Bank, we have not had any issues in terms of capital raise, as I mentioned. Uh, in 2019, pre-pandemic, um, our shareholders agreed uh, to increase our capital from uh, about $90 billion to $210 billion. And our shareholders have also, I mean, some of them, both African countries and non-African countries, have accelerated you know, payments of their subscriptions because the idea is they'll pay the subscriptions over a number of years. So that definitely you know, demonstrates the confidence that our shareholders have in the African Development Bank. However, for other DFIs, um, they've been looking to capitalize, I won't say recapitalize, They've been looking to capitalize because, you know, the amount of need has increased significantly as a result of COVID. And we, the MFIs, are supposed to be counter-cyclical. So we're supposed to really step in in a big way when we have these sorts of disruptions, you know, global disruptions, you know, whether it's from a pandemic or otherwise. So th their fundraising effort has, you know, been a little mixed. But the good news is that we're really out of that initial curve. Uh, and part of the reason it's been, it's been uh, you know, mixed is this is the first time we've had a global pandemic. We've had epidemics which are regional. So essentially the whole world uh, was actually disrupted. And it's taken time to get comfortable you know, with the decisions on investments. So we're actually seeing an improvement in that space as we think about building back better. Okay, and, and a good example, Wally, you and I were talking about this is we've just come out of COP26 and we actually see huge opportunity in COP, you know, you know in, in, in the whole climate finance space, especially uh, private climate f finance as well. So we see, we see the, you know, the equity landscape changing and we do believe that, uh, you know, the opportunities for, you know, other MFIs that are in the capital raising mode to scale up. Uh, would, would actually improve. And we are going to be part of you know, making some of those early investments in a few of them as well. Good to know. And yeah. if we can just pivot to that conversation about climate finance. Um, I was reading about this and clearly there is, there is really a watch list, if you like, of, of financing out there. Um, but the big question is getting it into Africa, into um, projects uh, that qualify, so to speak. Um, can you just speak to how DFIs can support that process? Okay, so we, we have to be careful. Uh, you know, there were pledges made by the developing world and, you know, those monies have not necessarily materialized since COP25. However, when it comes to private sector funding, uh, looking for impact investments, uh, yes, there is significant, you know, uh, assets under management, you know, across the world uh, for which, you know, um, a good, a good uh, portion has been allocated to impact investments. Uh, and, and impact investments would also include, uh, you know, renewables um, and, and, and such that are very uh, critical to realizing COP26. So that market, that opportunity is there, uh, but we have to, we have to, you know, implement the right, uh, you know, instruments to attract that, you know, funding. Uh, we also have to create a pipeline of bankable projects. So, you know, as DFIs, we're coming together to really focus on what are the critical bottlenecks to generate in those impact investments, whether it's, you know, whether it's in renewables, uh, you know, whether it's in a reduction of gas flaring um, or, or even more efficient use of renewable, you know, uh, you know, renewable energy as well. So, you know, if, if we're able to implement that, you know, we, we would then see the, you know, those funds that are available for impact investments better channeled uh, to, to the opportunities. So we have to solve the opportunities by really working hard to create bankable projects and the DFIs are well placed to do that. Uh, we're, we're working with Africa 50 to do that and hopefully we may even scale up that initiative to bring in other partners so that we create you know, the bankable climate resilient projects uh, for, these, for these institutions to invest in. Another point that came out of our conversation on the panel was partnerships, local partnerships, because clearly um, multilateral DFIs can't be everywhere. So you have to work with the local partners. Um, how, how do you see that partnership changing moving forward? And in terms of the service delivery, if you like, from the DFI side to those partners, um, could we see, for example, a new um, group of 
transactions or products that potentially you will be working with these partners to deliver to particularly small businesses. Okay. So one of the main reasons we work with local financial institutions is really to provide SME financing. So to provide financing to SMEs because we don't have the global presence to be able to reach the SMEs. If you take a look at the African Development Bank's private sector portfolio, about 55% of that is really to the financial sector, which means to SMEs. So we've been doing a lot and we've also been working with the same banks to actually improve their capacity to understand SMEs as an investment class. And, and, and know how to de-risk those projects. And we've also been working with the SMEs themselves to improve their capacity so that there's confidence from the local financial institutions to finance them. However, having said all of this, um, there's still a gap, there's a huge gap. So what we really need to do is figure out ways to scale it up. And so this is where we're engaging with, you know, with the local financial institutions to understand really you know, the reasons for their risk aversion uh, you know, towards, uh, you know, financing SMEs and, and to actually support in addressing, you know, uh, you know, those areas. As a result, for example, uh, to actually focus on women-owned SME businesses, uh, we've, uh, we've been able to design a program around risk sharing with local banks, uh, you know, to do up to about $5 billion worth of invest investments over the next, you know, over the next five years. Uh, similarly, we're establishing the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks to work, you know, really with local venture capital and local, you know, uh, commercial institutions to finance youth entrepreneurs as an investment asset class. So, you know, these are some of the things that we're actually looking to do to scale up. And once again, we cannot do it alone. So we're working really, you know, with our partner institutions, including the African DFIs that you saw today, to be able to achieve that. I know your purview at the African Development Bank includes industrialization. So let's talk briefly about that because there is certainly a very strong link between industrialization and trade, especially across the continent. So let, let's hear more about evolution of industrialization in Africa, so to speak. Uh, I think the great thing about where we're at is that it provides a fresh opportunity to learn from the mistakes that others have made in the past, of course, to also build in a sustainable way. Um, your perspective on how we are moving ahead on, as a continent in this area. So you, you said one of my responsibilities is industrialization. I, I would even venture to say the most important responsibility I have is, in, in, is industrialization. Because Africa has to move away from exporting uh, you know, uh, raw commodities. And we also need to actually understand that, the, you know, some of the value addition, uh, you know, uh, products that we can create, we can trade amongst ourselves. So for us, industrialization is, is really a big focal area. And, 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 and we are seeing, you know, we are seeing Africa, you know, learn from, you know, from Asia and from other models. And, and, and we're, we're looking to actually, you know, uh, have that done in a transformational way. Uh, we've prioritized five industri industrialization value chains to focus on, of which the key one is really about food processing. And, and one of the lessons we've taken really from the rest of the world is the importance of using industrial parks and special economic zones uh, to, to create the processing arm, but linked really with the production from across the country. Okay, so, so this is an example of, you know, a key model that we've adopted, we've seen successful, you know, in, in Asia and other places, uh, you know, to, uh, to expedite or to accelerate, you know, Africa's industrialization. We want to make sure, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the CFTA does not create really a zone of 1.3 billion people of consumers, but it actually creates an industrial zone. Uh, but in addition to food processing, uh, we also plan to focus on cotton to textiles to garments. Uh, we also plan to focus really on the protein side, so beef, you know, to leather, but of course to meat. Uh, we, we plan to incorporate the fourth industrial rev revolution really across all industries. And lastly, uh, you know, the last two, we have an abundance of gas resources, so gas beneficiation, gas to fertilizer is critical for us. 
And one of the lessons really as a result of COVID is it's important to have a minimum security of supply in the pharmaceutical industry. So, so these are the industrialization value chains that we as the AFDB has, you know, have prioritized. But there are other value chains. You know, the whole idea is Africa, you know, as a unit, uh, should find ways and, and, and poles within Africa to actually, uh, you know, implement these, these value chains. Emmanuel, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for your time. So, FEDA, the Fund for Export Development in, in uh, Africa, very significant in terms of how the African Bank is supporting that whole intra-Africa trade. Can you just speak to where you are at now? Um, it's been a couple of years now. And maybe perhaps you can mention a few key milestones at this stage. Right. Thank you so much, Wale, for having me. Um, I'm excited to speak with you. I know sometime in the course of last year, I actually spoke with TNBC, and um, I think we've made quite some progress uh, from where we were at the time. Uh, but just to sort of provide a bit of context, uh, FEDA, which is an acronym for Fund for Export Development in Africa, is uh, an African bank initiative that has been created specifically to target to provide equity capital in the, meeting, in the, in the missing space um, in the African market. Basically to achieve three objectives. Number one is to support the growth in intra-African trade. Number two is to support the growth in value-added exports what we also call export development, ex-Africa. The third one is to support the growth in industrialization on the continent. And African Bank, you know, has been at the forefront of leading development and initiatives like that on the continent. And FEDA is, you know, one of the game-changing equity investing keys because when you look at the environment, find there's a lot of capital, people would say, but um, equity gap is still there, so about $110 billion from an equity gap perspective. And structurally also, funding is not going to certain sectors that will release you know, and unlock value for the continent, which is around trade, so we are set up to do that. And we also look at where this capital you know, um, is sort of flowing into. A lot of capital on the continent is on that side, so about 10% of funding that comes into the continent is what comes into the equity space and equity as you know from an instrument perspective is that long-term patient capital that will unlock value that a lot of smes may not have capacity to even borrow they may not have structure to be able to attract debt but for equity we don't just provide funding but we actually partner with with you know people so there's a partnership mindset that we approach our investing with and with that, of course, we get involved, we get on boards of companies that we invest in, uh, we agree strategy, we implement, we execute. So where are we today? Um, I'm happy to share with you that between last year and now, um, we've registered quite a number of milestones. Number one, we've been able to, uh, you know, basically put together a team. After getting operationalized in 2019, sometime in the last quarter, we've been able to bring together our team, which you know is very experienced and also diverse, a lot of talent, experience both on the continent and outside as well. So we bring that team together, and um, we've started working together. Number two, we've raised our pipeline of deals, good quality, high potential opportunities. Uh, today is put at about five hundred million dollars, oh, about five hundred. What number? Absolutely, five hundred million dollars in terms of pipeline. So we've done that. And, and we've also, continent, yes, so we have that right now in terms of pipeline. Number three, we've been able to also get member states. Because remember, we are set up just like African Bank. So we are an international institution established by a treaty. So we've been able to uh, register about five member states currently, um, including Rwanda, Mauritania, South Sudan, Guinea, and Togo. And a number of other countries are in, have progressed significantly in their different processes, and we expect that number to rise as well. Um, and we have completed our legal establishment as an entity as well, so we now can operate as FEDA. And that is something that we're very excited about. Uh, the requirement for that was to get at least two member states of Afrozen Bank to sign and ratify the FEDA establishment agreement, and that 
we are done and we're quite uh, happy with that progress. Beyond that, we've done our first deal as well. I was just going to ask yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. we've done our first deal. Interesting deal, um, you know, in the TMT space and it's a trade enabling kind of investment and we're very pleased to have that first one. And we have about three other deals that have progressed quite a bit. We've gotten all the internal approvals, we're done with due diligence, findings are quite uh, good, we've found opportunities, you know, even within those to create value significant. So in the course, it's very imminent. Uh, we'll make some more uh, announcements around. Well, congratulations on that. It is certainly a milestone. But can you speak to the, the actions that you think can really crowd in more capital for intra-Africa trade-focused um, companies and entrepreneurs? Um, because I imagine that is one of the reasons why you have been set up to try and provide that support. So can you tell us your views on how, should I say, the whole financial ecosystem can, can bring in a little more capital for these, um, for these institutions? Yeah, thanks so much. So um, I'll start first with just speaking about systemically uh, what, what um, can deliver that uh, crowding in that you're talking about. Then I'd go speak about specifically what FEDA itself uh, is doing to sort of support that because I think that is important because you can theorize but when you then get to a point you know that you need to you know you need to deliver on what in the, the real life situation is you know that that is what counts ultimately so let me say that um, to be able to get that capital attracted I think as Africa we must be competitive because capital looks for home is that home that would be able to accept it and provide you know the, the ground the fertile ground for it to grow uh, you know no matter what whether you're looking at the people that are looking at strictly risk and reward like the pure play private equity firms or you're looking at those of us who are more development oriented because one of the things we do we ask uh, you know is how is this investment going to you know impact africa before we talk about returns but people on the other side uh, pure commercial play you know, speak the other way around, which is they look at the risk and then they look at the reward. So, number one, Africa must be competitive. And when we're talking about Africa being competitive, we're talking about a number of things, institutions. So what are our formal institutions like? Can you enforce contracts, for example? Um, do we have, you know, do we have the right governance in place as well? And then apart from uh, that, we also need to, need to talk about infrastructure. How is this enabling? We're talking about soft and hard infrastructure. Um, would this support investment? Because investors are looking at that as well. Then human capital. Because investors want to see, um, you know, people. People are really what you work with. And we need to continue to invest in our people. Africa has a lot of talent. And unfortunately, there's been significant brain drain. But we can bring some of these, these parties that have led back. And we can also, you know, further, you know, capacitate the people that are, that, that, that are still here um, as well. And then we talk about, um, you, know, you know, talk about enabling environment. That's another bucket. So enabling environment is talk about ease of doing business. Um, it's sad that of the top 20, you know, ranked countries in ease of doing business, Africa only has one country there. But what we need to see is to do, see more African countries migrate into that top Right, because capital, like I said, looks for home and it will go to homes that it will find the fertile ground to go. So that enabling environment is also important. Then lastly, I would like to say that people like to have a sense of clarity. At least, I mean, you want to be able to predict to some extent what the outcome of the investment that you want to do is. So a number of factors go around that. Um, you want to have policy, stable policies. Uh, that would support, you know, capital, private sector capital to thrive. So really, this is a message to the authorities. To absolutely, government. absolutely. So we need to think, not just thinking as a regulator, but also thinking as an enabler, because we want to bring regulation to support capital, to support capital, you know, deployment in the environment, and also to be targeted at the right opportunity. So this goes, you know, beyond the private sector into the public. But now, let me quickly speak to. FEDA itself. You know, FEDA has been set up to by Afrexim Bank, who has done really well. The leadership of Afrexim Bank has really, you know, put itself out there to drive the change in Africa. 
which is why the vision of FEDA itself is to, you know, is to structurally transform trade on the continent. And we've been set up as an impact investment fund as well. So, so you find that for us, a platform has been created. And on that platform, we're basically building on initiatives. And these initiatives are targeted at different things. And I'll speak to one of them, um, which is uh, you know, partnerships. Basically looking at like-minded partners, then you identify value-adding initiatives, you bring them in. And when you bring them in, you work with them. So these are like-minded partners who will share the same philosophy with you. And then you're able to then ramp up that capital growth. And once you have the right environment, like I said, of course, capital will come. Right, so clearly the, pic paint, the picture you've painted is that Africa isn't perfect. So what would be your best advice to entrepreneurs who, are also, who also require this capital that potentially um, FEDA and others could provide to drive trade in Africa? Yeah, very good question, Wally. Um, you know, like they say, in investing is first who, then what. So what that means is that who you work with is almost more important than what you try to do uh, with the party because the best of ideas if the who is wrong then you don't get anything out of it so let's say that um, the first thing that parties you know should should do is basically to get themselves capital ready how do you get yourself capital ready i think organizations should begin to learn you know to build some governance i mean in the end if you have a one person that owns a company it's one piece. Now, if you have a, little, a smaller piece of that company and you have partners and that company has grown, you end up having a larger piece, uh, you know, piece of the pie. And you're also bringing in other you know, experts in, you know, to, to working with you as opposed to just setting up yourself and running. So my advice would be get yourself capital ready if you're a player in this space. Number two, begin to think big. Because in the end, what the common free trade area is doing is to basically open the doors, break down the barriers. So people shouldn't be scared of going across the borders and creating partnership. And then look for the best brands. Africa has talent. Engage them, create the right incentives for them, and then also look for you know, the right partners that would bring capacity, that would bring something beyond capital. And that is where parties like ourselves, Fed, are coming. Uh, so when we invest, we don't just invest and walk away. We get involved, we get on the board, we work with the management. We don't manage, but we work as investors and support uh, growth. And we also make introductions. We open doors, we give market access. So people must think big, like I said. People must take advantage of this opportunity because these are the kind of companies uh, we are looking to back. So I think the time is right for Africans to be bold about the business uh, that, they are, that, that, that they are passionate about. And there's funding, there's funding. We are partnering with a number of organizations. And like I said, our fund starting out at a billion dollars and Afrozen Bank has seeded that with about $350 million. So capital, of course, will not be unlimited, but certainly um, you would find the right capital going for the right opportunities and then working with the right people. So if you have those pieces come together, of course, the enabling environment is right as well. I think Africa is just about to take off. Let's leave it on that optimistic note. Thank you. Thank you.